Welcome back, everyone, and uh, to Kaiser Reich. I'm your host, Mr. Uh, China Lover. But uh, we got to talk about Wang Leping murdered. A grisly murder has been reported in Nanjing today, while many have grown apathetic to the death and violence around them, even among prominent politicians. This one has stirred up considerable emotions. Wang Leping is a longtime socialist revolutionary from Wulian County in Shandong. A prolific writer, progressive, and activist, he has often served as a contact point between Wang Jingwei's camp and other socialist factions. By 1926, it was the first alternative. Uh, a Central Executive Committee member and also spent time working under Deng Yanda and Feng Zhuxiang. Generally well liked, or at least respected, he turned away from Shen Du Zhu and Marxism. Instead, he found his home in the moderate wing of the Reorganized Comrades Association, co writing the advanced newspaper with Gu Meng Yu. Suspects continue to abound as people wonder the motivations of the crime. The nature and brutality of crime generally points to Dai Chong Feng and his men who have considerable network of contacts in the Xiangnang region since the League of Ten Days. The RCA have extended their accusations to the entire army, believing this to be the culmination of a longer campaign of coercion against RCA-aligned politicians. PAC politicians have fired back, noting that Wang Leping is often on the verge of sliding with them, and Zhu and Lai's Red Square, or Squad, often can match the league in ruthlessness when it comes to silencing traitors. It is unlikely that the true culprits will ever be caught, and the best the police will catch a few low-life uh, scapegoats, but as suspicions arise, it seems that one narrative will generally prevail, even if not everyone believes it. Dai Chung Feng and the army surely are to blame. Zhu and Lai and the Deep State were behind it. Yeah, I think so. But we're doing better here. We've actually, I'm not sure why they did it, but they started doing worse here. Uh, Nanjing, and this is still a pretty bad mess, but still better than it was. And we actually kicked them out of Qingdao, which is actually really nice. It, of course, it helps that, uh, well, the German East Asia is doing okay. The Republic of Siam is doing great. They're doing okay here, but not really. Um, Barty Cummings on two-front war. Uh, oh, and actually, the Dutch East Indies have done decently down here, too. Look at that. Uh, and, in, and in Feng Shan, we're doing all right. Mongolia, well, I just let the AI do whatever they want to do. And as long as we're defending, that's all I really care about. So, but other than that, uh, we've got the trade, not trade, no, this is not EU4. Um, the, pff, what do we call this? God dang it, I can't remember what it's called now. Uh, supply hub here, duh. Here, and we're doing, honestly, pretty decently overall. I'm actually kind of pleased with how things have turned out so far. Um, with everything else going on up in the north. It just takes time, it just takes so much time to get everything through, but... Uh, they're at half a million casualties. We've delivered a third of a million. We've taken a quarter million casualties ourselves, so we're doing all right. Uh, I guess we're finding these guys too, and Mongolia's not doing well. They've only up to 17 divisions, but we're doing in Chinese industrial cooperatives. And Dare to Die Corps, the tradition of heroic martyrdom dates, dates back to the years before the Xenai Revolution, when revolutionary martyrs charged forward in a battle without a care for their life, but filled devotion to the country. Now they find ourselves in pursuit of the revolutionary mission. We must encourage those within our forces to prepare, be prepared to give the ultimate sacrifice necessary. National Reconstruction Commission. Uh, this commission was the idea of doc late Dr. Sun Yat Sen to help rebuild China's economy after years of foreign humiliation. We'll seek to end the era of being semi feudal and semi colonial state by embarking in a rapid and vast program of modernization, bringing China from the developing world to one that can hopefully rival the West. Embrace autarky, huh? Versus this one. Create the NEC. Us, present us with more decisions in our ongoing National Reconstruction Commission. Oh. In order to better coordinate, the National Reconstruction Commission, a committee known as the National Economic Council, has been set up to manage the country's new autarkic policies as well as to promote a rapid industrialization and extraction of our natural resources. Through carefully and bureaucratically uh, centralized economic planning, we'll be able to bring about the administrative and economic unification of our country. This is not too bad, actually. I'm oh, still need to do all this stuff here, too, but I guess we'll talk about broad front operations capacity. But well, the National Revolutionary Army performed in larger than ever before. We're now able to adopt greater operational capacity on broader fronts, with improved reconnaissance units, as well as a greater understanding of logistics and air power. The NRA will be able to undertake the greater and larger campaigns than it was previously thought capable of, molding China's future. Although professing to be a revolutionary vanguard, that does not mean that Kuomintang intends to leave the people out of the revolutionary struggle. Indeed, they have mobilized peoples, men and women, from all corners of the nation, and they have hardly forgotten the youth. Lin Bo Sheng, the Minister of Propaganda, organized the youth corps, Qing Yang Tuan, for youth between 16 and 25. Members swore absolute loyalty to the party and gave them paramilitary training. The corps morphed into the youth league. Qing Xiang Yang Tuan operated several camps dedicated to teaching public speaking for propaganda and self assessment. The PAC and the military allies have formed their own Chinese New Democracy Youth League and an off group of other youth movements established in the Mingan era. Similarly, authoritarian and bent, they seek to create a totally dedicated and altruistic youth meant to evangelize and organize to the masses for the revolutionary struggle. Others have tried to mimic them with less success. The League of Chinese Syndicalists have created the Syndicalist Youth League of China, skirting the boundaries or bounds of their ostensibly democratic ideology. The China Revival Society even formed the three principles of the People Youth League, somewhat even more extreme than its militaristic totalitarianism than the others. 
Ironically, perhaps the most unique and dearest to mundaneness is the Boy Scouts of China, patronized by families affiliated with the Reconstruction Faction. Based off Baden, Baden Powell's international movement, it provides a contained form of youth activism with an emphasis on individual cultivation, a slight degree of apolitical liberalism, and a dash of military discipline perfect for the RF. Uh, indeed, as Mayor uh, Sun Fo incorporated it into the Guangzhou school curriculum, uh, KMD, CND, or par parents may freely enroll as they please. So, it increases radicalism, but also decreases itself. We'll go with that one, they can choose. But we're doing alright so far, still. So. We have quite a bit of political power, actually, which is pretty nice. Uh, I don't think anyone else here has really changed. RCA, Madame Wang, huh? Hmm. Mm, nope. Oh. Operatives, spy master. Even more operative slots, that'd be kind of cool, actually. Uh, but I want to see if there's anything else there. Or we could just... You know what, we would not, what else are we going to do with our political power? These people can't even elect anybody here, so screw it. We're going to get more operative slots. <clears throat> But up here it's looking very nice finally. Oh, the, over here it's looking even better now. And we actually finish off the stuff in the far south, or just south, I guess. You know, this is far south, more than where my mouse is. Uh, we're getting ready to launch a potential attack using the horses. So, it's definitely looking better for us. We've got actually a surplus of 3,000 guns. Abin is now a frontline city. And we just finished some encirclements right here, which is actually very good. So, actually, we might try a general attack because the uh, Feng Shan just does not look very strong at all. So that might work out, maybe. <clears throat> they are spreading out a little bit, but that's alright. I'm going here. You might be able to do okay against the Philippine divisions. They're desperately trying to hold out, but we'll see. Um, I want you to go here. You can circle them that way. Hey, there you go. And there you go. They tried to really not get encircled. And you won. Nice job, guys. Mm, I'll do this one last time. I'll do this one, why not? Mechanized attack and defense. It's kind of unique. Very nice, very nice, very nice. So here we definitely want to get here. Not sure why you went all the way up there, but whatever. Hello. Okay then. <clears throat> we do want to get to lessons of war eventually too, though. So good. Well, they're not navy. Oh, never mind. I was going to say they're not no longer navy invading us, but I guess I was wrong about that. <clears throat> Where are you guys at? Uh, if you keep them here, you might be able to do something really good. Oh, you know what? You go here. You go here. Y'all do that. Y'all keep these guys in place. Don't let them move. Um, you know what? We're going to try. Will it work? It looks like for the most part, it's doing quite alright. Even in Korea, towards Pyongyang, we're doing okay. We wanted to build up a naval base here. Ah, but the nonpartisan bastion of the NRA. Which I think I read before as well. Huh. <clears throat> Engines are good. Very, 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 very good. 1940s. Almost 1941. Um, sure, we'll do that, which I don't think will really work very well, but Zeng Pingru. Yeah, sure, why not? There you go. Hey, look at this. Nice. We need you to definitely go there. What's next here? Fun the game? Sure. Material support? Sure, why not? Alright, you're going to do this and you're going to force the attack. <clears throat> if they have no strength, well, they can't do very much, can they? Or no coordination, really. Uh, and there goes the Feng Shuang government. We got some oh, anti-air guns. We got almost 2,000 rifles. Nice, 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 nice. Ooh, let's talk about here, too. Very good. Cut them out. All right, so we're looking pretty good. Ah, divisions in circle. I love it. Actually, in part of Japan, you're looking a bit more pale than normally Korean-esque. But we're doing better. <clears throat> Actually, we're doing very well right now. Two divisions, huh? Pretty small airframes are very good. You think here? Uh, no, 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 no. <coughs> Excuse me. And since we're here, we might as well try a little something here, right? Hey, there you go. China can into the space. Not into space. Into uh, the air. Do we have any bombs? No. Anti wait, anti tank cannons. Oh, well, maybe not. We're going to wait for that one then.
You can lose as much as you want, you're gonna die there. Um, Albania's doing the don't know Adrian Boone. Actually, how's the rest of the world looking, actually? It's a good question. Uh, these guys are forcing defense. I mean, I guess I would too. They were literally gonna die there, anyways. Uh, looking alright, looking alright, not bad. Ireland's declared war in Northern Ireland. Oh, wow. Russia, Germany's doing alright. Ukraine's fallen just a tiny bit, but they're not, they have not completely fallen. Good for them. We're doing, actually, oh, look at that, they're expanding down here too. Nice, things are looking really up for us right now. Good stuff. Oof. Um, now we can't break over, which sucks. We had a pretty good run right there for a few seconds. Oh, well, we might actually still have another run here. Oh, pretty good. Get down and follow that supply line all the way through here if you can. Kong Wu. March of the Red Army. Modern Chinese soldier. Yeah, it's looking a little better here now. Nice. I'd like to send you guys this way, but... But what's the point? Uh, if anything, actually, it'd probably be best to send you to Mongolia. Fight horses with horses, shall we? What is this? Infantry specialist? Well, I think we already have one, technically, don't we? And there goes Northern Ireland, what do you expect? <clears throat> Panama. Ham Hung. There you go. Nice. Keep it up. <clears throat> Come the Sapper schools are good. Excavation. More excavation because I know we're out of steel and we're already importing stuff from like Russia and whatnot. There you go. Hey, we do have a port there too, which is pretty nice for us. Um, 80%? There you go. Why not? Alright, looks like they don't have any defenses left here. Which is fantastic. Go in. See what you can do. How strong is Mongolia? And the Roman von Ungern Sternberg. Really helping out the Russians. Or love the Russians. They're almost out of manpower. I'm sure they're out of guns. Ah, Pyongyang is surrounded. And never mind. Pyongyang is ours. Five divisions, including Filipino divisions. Ah, the young companion hits Chelts. A company of the Mingguo Rabao, the young companion is a pictorial that has enjoyed widespread popularity amongst youth throughout China. It comes from the Lingyao Book Company under Wu Lianda, although recent editions have been edited by Liang Desu and Ma Guoliang. Aside from featuring generals of the National Revolutionary Army, such as Zhang Fakui, the pictorial is notable for its cover girls. Oh, yay. Beautiful women adorned the covers of recent editions. They appeared of Shmi Shion, moving in motion and participating in Western sports while dressed in Western clothes, making such editorials popular among soldiers in the NRA, nonetheless. Uh, these women are on the pictorial covers. They're not dressed to be seeking men, but rather they're living their lives and enjoying the high life in Shanghai. Such women all also appear on the covers, include actresses such as Anna Mei Wong and Chen Boer, but also female officers of the NRA such as Hu Langqi. The soldiers will love it. Oh, yes, they do. I guess they will. Alright, sure, why not? A champion for the workers and peasants. Uh, uh, if the National Revolutionary Army had ever had a face since General Chiang's untimely death, it would be Deng Yang Da. His story career has taken him to the halls of Wampo, to the cities of Europe, the hills of Jing, Jiangqing, and now the battlefields across China. With every success, his prominent rise is creating a powerful nucleus for those seeking an alternative to Wang's rule, but as his prestige soars, sometimes even his closest allies fear flying too close to the sun. I'll read the rest. If you read, read about the rest of this guy, please go right ahead. But, social so, 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 my bad. I forgot that I actually read that one already. Oh, no, I read a lot of things, don't I? <clears throat> Looking decent. We need more artillery, though. Drugs, we actually have enough support coming. Look at that. Go figure. Busan, please. Straight to Busan. Because, unfortunately, the Japanese destroyed our navy earlier. I don't know why they gave up on fighting the war. Well, we delivered almost a million casualties to them. Um, in all honesty, if you wanted to be smart, you could go that way, I guess, and go there, probably. Sure, why not? There you go, go in. And, oh, oh, okay, so this is different. The soul of Wampoa. We get different things now. More attack and defense for divisions, but infantry gets worse stats. Artillery gets worse, too. Interesting. Huh. They get more army XP, too, which we, can, we could really use, so.
Well, no, what do you guys do? I guess we could probably start uh, converting you guys over. Um, there we go. Ta -da. Good job, guys. You did a great job. I don't want to go down here because it's going to be god awful fighting down here. I guess, if anything, you guys can come over to this group. And you are what? Doing all right? Got some material support, that's fine. Honestly, I don't even want to use you guys over there. Uh, there you go. See, it's just, it's just a dude. Da, 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 da. Oh, there goes the fading sun. The loss of the Korean Peninsula and Port Arthur to foreign ports was a serious blow to Japan's ongoing warfare. Unless we're able to get a foot on the mainland, the domestic unrest sparked by the numerous defeats we have inflicted on them will soon face the empire of the rising sun to the negotiating table. Ah. Yeah. Exactly. That's our plan all along. There you go, help him out. Maybe. How much more manpower does Mongolia have? Got it, 15, 2 to 3,000, it's not much. Marsh Manchuria. Silva Wampoa. Reinforce the rear guard. While elite troops are distracted on the front lines, we should also take steps to ensure that the rear guards or rear areas are secured. Despite the victory of the NRA and the Second Northern Expedition, there are plenty of regions within the country that are yet to be completely pacified. In order to maintain this order and legitimacy, we will provide a greater deal of support to our rear guard forces. Uh, hope with this one, restore the Ministry of the Navy. The Navy has ailed over the last few decades, forced to play a subservient role. Uh, secondary prior could compare to the army. Uh, an auxiliary force for foreign concessionists and a money pit for treasury, no more. If China is to be truly free, it must have a navy capable of defending its shores and protecting its trade. The first step is to create an independent command capable of overseeing its revival in the church and nationals China. Religion teaches men obedience, which is a moral code of slaves. Religion propagates superstitions, which hinder the search for truth. These other proclamations often found in Beijing, placed by a resurgent great federation of anti-religionists. The federation is a movement by many Chinese intellectuals, uh, both directly part of the KMT and outside of it. Anti-clericalism in China often has multiple roots, as the Ch Christian Church in particular is opposed by the intelligentsia for its perceived backwardness, as well as its association with foreign imperialism. Uh, the mutual disdain has attracted socialists, anarchists, and nationalists are together in this campaign, protesting, for example, the Royal Student Christian Federation conference scheduled to be held at Tsinghua uh, University. At the women's home, once included many luminaries such as Li Zhizheng, Cheng Duzhiu, Kai Duanpei, uh, uh, Li Daozhao, and Wang Jingwei. Not everyone of the party has an antagonistic relationship with the religion or even Christianity for that matter. The Song family patriarch Song Xiao Xu was a Methodist minister and raised all of his children in the faith. Dr. Sun Yat sen and some folk converted to the faith as well. Many others find themselves in more complicated situations living between their Confucian inspired upbringing and exposure to Christian preaching. Zhang, Fa Kui, and his wife, for example, were loosely affiliated with the Roman, Roman Catholicism, though not fully converted. Cautious of being abroad in these touchy matters, both Wang Jingwei and Song Qingling have largely refrained from making any official statement in public despite their respective pasts. Offering only generic statements asking for peace and mutual support, but these oftentimes, but oftentimes as the revolution's claims of social change hit a delicate nerve as China continues to change. The church is subversive. The church has its place. Well, I like radicalism. Radicalism's a lot of fun. Debts and payback. There was no love lost between Zhu and Fu Hai, and others within Wang's inner circle, but nonetheless, he was still one of them. And after what happened to him, Wang and his allies have been plotting their revenge for some time, just waiting for long enough for the scandal to fade from public view before counterattacking and strike back they did. The RCA held little back when they began following up on leads regarding financial pro uh, property propriety surrounding the central bank of China, run by Song Ziwen and his clique. Investigators claim to have found significant discrepancies in the counting following a preliminary audit and have already begun a series of arrests. As it continues to chase down the paper trail, Song has defended his compatriot's actions in a closed-door CEC hearing as being necessary to pay off various illicit debts accrued by the party during the insurgency. A revolutionary necessity, moreover, it notes that continuing this investigation will undermine the fragile stability of the central bank. No one has yet accused Song himself, a CEC member, and Song Qingling's brother, of any wrongdoing, but as the hounds close in, it is increasingly obvious that this witch hunt is a reprisal for the Ye uh, Guangdao crisis. Pointedly, Chu Minyi Min Yi is said to have already been lined up to replace Song, a testament to the resident's faction's growing power. Faced with the prospect of being publicly disgraced, Song has expressed a preference to quietly resign from his CECFC or retaining his responsibilities in the financial world as his sister's allies scramble to respond. Resigns to save face. Ooh. Song survives today. We're going to save face. Also, the Japanese reinvaded again, which kind of sucks for us, but whatever. They do not yet have a port, and hopefully they don't get a port. You're not going to die. You're going to die there, or are you going to get rid of them? So, your two options. 
Get rid of those Japanese Marines and those Japanese horses. Dominus of the rear organ its comrades. Strong leadership can unite and strengthen a cause, but when too much power is concentrated around a single leader and his clique, there are often severe ramifications. Uh, <clears throat> Wang and his allies have been steadily accruing power across the government, taking advantage of his position as chairman of the ever weakening CEC and president of the Republic. This absolute near power of his rivals, however, has also stopped internal discourse and made it difficult to present even legitimate grievances against his policies. The RC and the residence faction have grown bolder to the point of arrogance, and perhaps even worse than the complacency is that they've already begun fighting over the spoils across major institutions. Wang's rivals are hardly extinguished, however. Dissatisfied and no longer feeling that they can achieve change through legitimate channels, many feel enticed towards other means of ousting Wang. If the chairman wishes to step up and be the wise statesman he claims to be, this would be the time that the stability of the Republic is at stake. Let's ratchet down the tensions a bit. Let's press our advantage while we can. Uh, we'll lose war support from that one. But honestly, oh, fate of Mongolia. We did take out Mongolia after a successful campaign in the steps of Mongolia. We now have the task of establishing a local administrative authority in order for peace. However, there's also several options for our choice. We're also doing lessons of war. The lessons of war have taught us considerably in the ways of modern conflict. With renewed ambition, we must pursue major structural reforms to bring our forces up to date, building a force that can stand the test of time. Well, outer factions, we're already at 100%. The balance of power has gone too far in one direction. Although this might be advantageous in some respects, stability will slowly be lowered until national unification and the end of the power struggle. Bringing things to more stable equilibrium might be the best for the long-term stability of the Republic. We don't need any more radicalism. We're already at 100%, so we're going to go with this one. It's 99%. Jesus Christ. That's already pretty darn good. Yeah, get your butts in there. Uh, excavation. We're already going to work on it. We could go to total mobilization. We lose political power, though. But we'd build a little faster, wouldn't we? Yeah. Excavation 2? Excavation 1, shall we? Yes, please. Um, the March to Manchuria? Well, let's do this one next. Liberate Loyal Mongolia? Annex of Mongolian lands? Look at this. We lose political power stability war support. And we get claims on Mongolia and get compliance on them. Of course we are. That's fantastic. But, like, yeah, we can't really do much here. As we reinforce the rear guard, and we can't afford to lose uh, up here. So once these guys are gone and taken care of, there you go. You guys are also going to do double uh, keeping, uh, double gu guard duty, basically, along all of this area here until these guys fully die. Uh, because we can't afford to lose this. So. Don't forget about Nantong. Jingdao, Wei Highway. And Def can't lose Korea here either. Or Busan. So spread out. Clear your spots. And then we'll bring the cavalry down and really go to town on the enemy here. Um, well, I guess, you know, 10 combat is not ideal, but. Actually, how much more trucks do we have? We have none. Well, we're going to 20 combat with then. No, I'll just do it like that. There you go. Not mechanized. No, 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 no. There you go. We need a few more guns, but that should be alright. Over here, what do we got? Ah, developing a rule of Mongolia. After the National Revolutionary Army was swept into power and the Uruguay drove out all before them, the joys of victory were soon replaced by the difficulty, or difficult reality, of governing such a wide, sparse, populated land. Mongolia's few permanent settlements remain deeply poor and agrarian. Despite claims of national unification, equality among the five races, many Mongolians have grown accustomed to independence and deeply suspicious of Chinese nationalism. Serang Dongrub, Bai Yuntian Chinese, a long-time Kuomintang member and SRCA affiliate, has been installed chairman of Mongolia. The Mongolian and Tibetan Affairs Commission has ostensibly been prepared ethnic, preparing ethnic minorities in the party for tutelage. In their home regions, however, the ranks remain very thin. The Serang Dongrub's Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party had only limited traction in Inner Mongolia to the south. The pre-existing KMT me membership is still limited. Staffing for the new government has been supplemented by members of existing socialist and leftist groups in Mongolia, most notably the Mongol Arden Nam, Mongolian People's Party, based primarily in the Western Mongolia. Leaders have insisted on considerable concessions from the Han-dominated central government, though they often bicker and jockey among themselves for power. The alternatives are not particularly savory either. While most Russian-backed warlords have fled, the former Mongolian nobility and other conservative interests led by Onen Bayam and Prince Dong Chang, uh, Dong Grub remain active. More moderate elements in Urga, such as uh, Onen Bayan, have expressed an openness to joining the KMT, likely in hopes of continuing their entrenched influence over the area. There's some doubt whether or not these discussions ultimately matter for the common folk, especially as resistance is expected to continue. Juno Ulanhu, one of the highest ranking ethnic Mongolian military officers in the NRA, has been charged with maintaining order, supposedly decimates with Chiang Ching Kuo, while studying in the international and having ties to military intelligence. Some wonder about his loyalties. His family is said to have been already amassing considerable power among the locals. 
Lena the chairman of the Comanting Cadres, and power regional X Man socialist leaders. Grant ethnic autonomy to local power brokers. Decrease radicalism. Real power remains with the military governors. Hey, we need more stability and totalism, so we're gonna go with that one as we reinforce the rear guard. Um, fate of a Republican. With the success of the Second Northern Expedition, the KMT has emerged from a shattered revolutionary movement back to the situation of national contendership. As the Nationalist Party now is both the Northern and Southern Capital, let's reach out to the fellow non party aligned Republicans and turn them into a sense of support towards the National Revolution. At this point, we're just kind of waiting for the war to end, so. Enter Gongjian Arsenal and the Hanyang Arsenal. Sure, why not? Hey, except for the Empire of Japan's done. Nice. Are you guys on your spots? You should be there by now. And you should be there. Okay, cool. Because uh, we're going to need you guys. I want you guys to lead the way into Southeast Asia. Because, my God, this is going to be god awful. There's a false Santiago. German Southeast Asia is falling apart. We get 0 0.31 political power a day. What are we missing here? Probably support equipment. I think it's probably support equipment. Right here. Here we'll lose weekly stability though. The tax police core. The salt tax is about as ancient as the Chinese state. With the record suggesting that the Han Dynasty uh, ordered salt and iron to become state monopolies in the first century BC. Scholars of the time believe that an indirect tax on the people was best upon the government without directly risking the ire of the people, nearly two, two millennia later. Salt remains a major source of wealth and power, though even before the war era, it was a heavily patchwork system. Oh, there goes, there goes that guy. The KMT has maintained the salt monopoly as accompanying a uh, gabelle or indirect tax, and by some accounts it pays for upwards of a third of the government's overall revenue. Breasting salt revenues from warlords has been a major source of wrangling tensions and diplomacy through with conquest of northern China's salterns, the prospect of a new revenue boon has enticed multiple government organs. To collect these taxes, escort funds, and enforce monopoly entire regiments have been independently formed both by our predecessors and our new central government. These units are often well trained and equipped, able to afford better supplies, and often tasked with crushing rebellious warlords. The Ministry of Finance under Zhang Ziwen was also one of the first to organize their salt gabelle brigades and consequently had the largest dedicated force. It sets on its necessity to prop up government banks and currency. The Ministry of Interior, on the contrary, however, insists such brigades belong under their jurisdiction, since law enforcement is a police matter and they have greater expertise. The armies have thrown their lot in, suggesting that perhaps with all the instability, only they can be trusted with such a task. Well, President Wang and the CEC have agreed that overlapping jurisdictions must end. The only question is who will receive the ultimate grant, left unsaid. This is mouth-watering amounts of money that can be skimmed off. Pecuniary matters belong with the finance. Law enforcement belongs with the interior. The defense of the state requires the army. I'd have to agree. Ah, more army XP. I love it. So, where are we at? You guys are racing to get down here, and you're already down here. Good job, guys. Well, you're trying to get there. Getting out. Ooh, and Canada's gone. Nice job, Canada. Mandalay, yes, please. Very good, very good, very good. Because that will lead us into a thing here. Supply hub. Right? There you go. And that'll connect everything here together, so. That'll be nice. Uh, let's see, 1941. Better military police? Sure. Hello? Oh. Well, how are we looking? How are we doing? That's not good. Um, I don't know, so you just gotta really come right here. Yeah, for the most part, the line mostly taken care of. We're looking, do a bit on artillery already, which is good. We need some more support equipment, though, which I figured as much. Have a de decent amount of planes. We need more resources ourselves. Ah, now you're not winning, huh? For shame. That's right, just hold out. Hello, I said hold. H, please, yes, no. The painting sun, good. Let's get that done with. Ah. The Mau Mau War, good job for you guys. 860 is not great, but it's getting slowly and slowly better. And eventually we'll get more political power, eventually, too. Lessons of war, integrate the Guangdong Arsenal, fellow Republicans. Um, force concentration. Definitely. Expanding the United Front, it was, wasn't always like this years ago, when the Dong Mengui first took power at the end of the Xinhai Revolution. It was hoped for a multi-partisan uh, democratic republic. 
But even as they entered Beijing for, for negotiations, sinister machinations were already in play, and the dream of a peaceful hand over power was dashed. In its wake, the KMT was formed by the aggrieved Dr. Sun. The party made its share of alliances with warlords and republicans, notably the constitutional protection movement, but ultimately came to naught, and Dr. Sun realized we were better off alone. The Chinese Inner Front, where the League of Chinese Socialists was the sole exception to this, and its decision to reach out to cynical's power splintered the party into factions, yet another painful memory for the very weary movement. Yet in the end, this is an alliance that now stands triumphant in Beijing. The question today has now to do with the others, the dozens of other factions who collaborated with the corrupt Bai Yang system. Many such as factions who have reached out in hopes of having a place in a new government. These politicians have a variety of motivations, some due to patriotism, some due to aligned goals, and others due to naked opportunism. Although the KMT professes the need for a one-party state during that tutelage, this does not need to be so literally interpreted, as the LCS can attest. Alternatives include allowing individual politicians to run as Dang Wai, literally outside of party or party outsider. For the scheme to work, a reasonable number of seats must be set aside for these independents, though obviously not enough to challenge Kuomintang rule. Another option is to simply absorb certain elements into the party directly. After all, there are plenty of people who have once wore allegiance to the broad tent Tong Mengui. To be warned, however, not everyone will be happy with the base of the party, even if our advances are our ultimate goal of democracy. But I'll send a message across the land that we are not a gaggle of socialist radicals, but a reasonable movement worthy of Dr. Sun's legacy. Allow them to run as Dong Wai in election. Expanding the Dong Wai will increase the opinion of us, of all remaining factions of China, making it easier to get the world to submit. The party has room to grow a little bit. We lose a lot of war support. Ooh, social conservatives will join the coalition. We have no use for them during the tutelage. I like stability. Maybe we can sacrifice a tiny bit of war support. The first state of the physics returns out. Look at that. Escaping for war torn in the United States, Chen Xuan Yu has returned home to China, hailing from the small town of Li Hu. Yu graduated at the top of her class in 1929 and was admitted to university in Nanjing as a teacher at a Shanghai public school. Uh, Wu had a close relationship with the school's president, the distinguished Hu Xi, who was acted as both a mentor and a second father for Wu. Due to the constant instability in China and the encouragement of fellow women researcher Gu Jingwei, Wu made the decision to emigrate to the U.S. in 1936, where they tend to study at the University of Michigan. Of course, everyone does. Wu was shocked at the sexism that lurked in American academia, and decided to prefer the much more liberal UC Berkeley, however. With the collapse of the PSA, Wu once again has returned to China. With the resources of Academia Sinica at her disposal, Wu intends to lead China's atomic program bringing China to the modern age. Bravo! Union of Socialist American States. Good job, Foster. Such is Commonwealth of Canada. Wow, it's going to be a very red world. Even though Germany's beating up the Third International pretty darn well. And Russia's slowly advancing through Ukraine and Belarus and whatnot. So, oh, and the Barty Company's not doing well either, are they? Good, that one would be done. That at least connect these things. Federalist principles in the movement. Federalism in its current state has been largely discredited within Kuomintang circles. That's because of its affiliation with Chong or Chen Zhongming, a Guangdong a general who broke with Dr. Sun in 1922 after a bitter series of mutual escalations. Many members of the party felt personally attacked, in many cases quite literally, by this betrayal, and the ensuing bad blood has poisoned the ties between Southern Republican groups. But federalism, as a concept, had its predecessors in the party. Uh, Li Shizang, for example, argued that federalism as a continuation of a proud, honest principle of federation, a necessary step in the eventual implementation of anarchism, and China, to him and others in the world society. A proper form of federalism would require sharing between central and local units. This cooperation would exist between villages, districts, provinces, regional councils, and up to the central government. Something referred to as a Fenzi Hezu, Hezuau, and identified with the French concept of regionalism and federalism. Eventually, the hope is that the worldwide federation would be established and power devolves slowly downwards until the state is abolished. This line of thinking has also been criticized not only by the Marxist inspired factions of the party, but also many of the nationalist factions in a notable turnabout in the early 20s. The uh, term self government was phased out of Kuomintang propaganda in favor of local administration to the Kuomintang self government. It became less associated with democracy, more associated with the continuation of warlordism, a fact not helped by Chen Zhongming's decision to help Wu Pai Fu's rule. Nonetheless, throwing a bone out there for the federalist remnants in the country would help smoothen the unification, but these short term compromises can only hold together for so long. But could they possibly be long enough to consolidate this, this alliance? Not bad. Absorb the Federalist remnants. Lose stability. Enforce centralization. We can consolidate it. Paying some lip service with Federalist principles to increase the opinion of us. Yeah, agree to us, yeah. 
reconciliation with uh, Kuomintang's right? One of the touchy subjects of the day in Nanjing, yet perhaps is the most ubiquitous compromises within the party states the rehabilitation of many writers in the party, or at least claiming to be members of the party. The practical distinction between the old KMT's left, right, and center, and military factions were always much more blurred than at the top, while figures such as Wang Jingwei, Liao Zongkai, Hu Hanmin, Sun Fo, Dai Jitao, and Chen Kai Shek quarreled over the Sun Yat Sen's legacy for most rank and file members of the party, represented one unified revolutionary movement. Leftists and writers often went to class together in Wampua, fought side by side in the trenches, and even were killed together by reactionaries. It is no surprise that even after all these years, an acrimony growing quite bitter, including mutual slander, assassinations, and even outright warfare, plenty of lower-ranking officers have helped their old friends find a place in a new government. For the better informed members of the party that's it and the CEC, the reality is drastically different. Most of the right KMT factions are warlords by this point, a facsimile of revolutionary spirit at best, and a mockery of our efforts at worst. The CEC looks down reconciliation, viewing them as far too gone, allowing these parties apostates into our ranks as a recipe for treason. Detention, or deception, or even worse, corruption, and this sort of aversion is dangerous in these times. And it's very difficult to actually legislate any official ban or even regulate it. And going against the grain is always hard, but even a few words by leading CEC members can hard, markedly change the mood of the party as a whole. They're genuine patriots. More war support. Well, we don't get any uh, rise in radicalism. And I like the political power, but I'll go to this one. They're genuine patriots. We're not the same. Of course not. Doesn't really matter in the end. Hey, look at that. More support attack. And, or thoughts attack, I should say, an organization. Good. That's looking better. Trucks are looking better. Guns are looking better. Artillery is looking better, too. Fantastic. Center line production. Nice, 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 nice. That's looking pretty good. We need bombs. I love bombs. Anyways. Nice. Good, good, good. Type B division, huh? Oh, did they invade us again? No, we're looking, honestly, pretty darn good at this point. You are just gonna do uh, that. There you go. Naval department, commando training. Do you need more horses over here? No. You're all infantry. That's not bad. Keep hanging out here because we got to get all these roads connected and whatnot. Because we got these guys, guys. Japan asked for peace. Having been early vanquished in the battlefields across the Asian continent by our victorious armies. Uh, the Japanese were retreated from the bases of Manchuria and Korea. With little hope of challenging or regaining supremacy on land, diminishing public opinion, and fears of a worsening disaster, as first Tokyo to the negotiating table, but now without playing one final card left in the hand, the Imperial Japanese Navy. Setting the threat of continued Japanese blockades and the need for both powers to be strong enough to resist Western imperialism, the terms they have offered have mostly been generous to, frankly, just the recognition of the status quo. Our ownership of continental Chinese territory will be recognized and all leases returned, Korea will be relinquished, and will withdraw from any other occupied members of the co-prosperity sphere. A non-Christian pact will be signed, and Japan will refrain from further meddling in Chinese affairs. Notably missing, however, is the land of Taiwan, which the Japanese fully intend to keep. Given the present inability to challenge Japanese domination of the seas and the various other issues their government faces, a prudent action might be the sign of this agreement. Huh? Japanese blockades and the coastline are no easy task on their end, but will disrupt our trade and economic stability to a crippling degree. However, Taiwan is seen as integral Chinese territory, ignominiously stripped from us after a defeat in the first sign of Japanese war. A total victory might take years, but could be worth to ensure Chinese unification. Let me keep the pathetic home miles, yeah. Well, let's go do that one. And in the second son of Japanese war. Uh, the War of 1894 to 95 has been a humiliating defeat for our nation. Now, the Japanese aggressors have finally been driven out, and we finally avenge our fallen brothers in the first son of Japanese war. No more shall we allow foreign imperialist powers to meddle in the affairs of a proud nation. No more China shall we subject, subjugate him, for we will be the masters of our own destiny once we. Until two years from now. Nice! Are we, who are we war with? The Feng Shang government? Nice. Good job, guys. Hey. We get a few screening ships? Nice. Wait, I can liberate two other nations, huh? Change government? Honestly, I'd rather not even bother with, like, liberating these guys. So, so not our problem now. There you go, you guys can go right here. Fantastic. So we gotta start working on the Navy then. Um, honestly, the cheapest and easiest thing would be just ships. Just subs. What the ships? And get Ying Kuo Naval Yard. The part of Ying Kuo Oko sits in a strategic side in the Yellow Sea, positioning, position a controlling position along the Dai Lao River and Liao Dong Bay. With Dai Lian, Port Arthur under Japanese control, Ying Kuo was effectively the sole port under the Sing Chung's clique's directly con direct control, and significant, significant, albeit insufficient, funding was provided to expand it as a home of the fleet. It's good they have learned plenty from the Japanese partners, and a skill set we must be able to utilize for developing our fleet of our own. Then in the Chinese United Front, now that the enemy invasion has come to a close. It appears that there is little need for the Chinese United Front already. 
The various warlords have begun refusing central government commands, and they're distancing themselves from Nanjing. It seems that things will go back to the way they were as various factions press their claims for a national leadership. So we demonstrated in the last war that we can lead China, that we can protect it from the enemy invasion, and disunity is not inherent but an illness caused by regional selfishness. May the people remember us and our accomplishments across the nation, and we will soon unite with them once again. Thus, victory. Demand Sichuan cliques uh, submission. Regional authorities in Chengdu have find themselves adrift as of late, swearing allegiance to nobody but themselves. As China is fully, truly legitimate government, we must bring them into the fold, and they will either accept or we will prepare other less courteous matters. Oh yes, we will. We are going to Chongqing as fast as we can, get some more political power, and increase the uh, integration of Shangxi. Although the leadership in Taiyuan has thankfully seen wisdom and decided to align themselves with us, uh, we must go further to truly end the warlord era. Efforts more will be made to bring the Shangxi administration closer to our own. Absolutely. There to die, core, which you don't need anymore. Uh, we'll keep doing through a lot of this stuff. We just do warlord stuff. I don't lose, lose any more political power. I read this last time, so if you're in this one, please go ahead. We give political power and more construction speed. Ship stuff, yes. That's good. Um, torpedoes, yeah. We're going to demobilize our economy eventually. Oh, we also have Korea. I kind of like having Korea. Does it make sense for us to keep Korea? Oof, that's a pretty costly one to do. Huh. After the final liberation of the proud nation of Korea, we were left with the responsibility of organizing the administration of the newly conquered territories. What shall we do? Uh, yeah, that makes sense to liberate a loyal Korea. It really does. Ugh. You know, uh, you know what? This is what I would never do. Return to the provisional government of the Republic of Korea. Because we did have that one guy fight with us. And now you know what? I'm going to liberate him for him. Radical socialists. As a result of the Japanese occupation of the country, various Korean guerrilla armies proliferated in Manchuria, Northern Korea, and the Chinese mainland throughout the 20s. Having received military and economic support from the sympathetic Chinese Kuomintang, the leftist faction of the provisional government of the Republic of Korea, appears to dominate the political scene of the newly independent revolutionary Korea. The leftist faction of the PGROC, led by Kim Wong Bong, a Korean revolutionary in exile and Wampo graduate, has been stationed in Shanghai since 1935. This faction, the so-called Korean National Revolutionary Party, shares many political values and facets with the Chinese Kuomintang and is essentially acts as a sister party within the potential Korean state now. With the Chinese victory over the Japanese in the Second Sino Japanese War. Wan Bong has officially handed his resignation as a general of the National Revolutionary Army to oversee and administer the newly liberated Republic of Korea. Wonderful. Good job, guys. And just a time for the war resistance to uh, finish, too. Are our soldiers here? We are poised and ready to strike. Do we have any planes? Oh, we have 25. Look at that. We actually have a couple planes. Fantastic. Oh, we have ships. We're going to need that naval XP, aren't we? Um, here, you lost everything last time, so don't lose it again. A declaration. As the revolution drags on, the party faces the conundrum. The movement, for which all of its divisions uh, was once concentrated while down on its last legs, has now grown to a critical point. As the national revolutionary government has swallowed up much of China, more and more non socialists have been absorbed to the ostensibly democratic party. Meanwhile, um, seeing, sensing victory, not wishing to water down the promise they have sacrificed so much for, plenty on the left has grown r radicalized. Soon, many fear the party will once again be back to the, another's throats like in 1924. This problem is taking shape in the clash of working papers being passed around the le legislative Xuan. The first is proposed that the central problem of China lies in the poverty of the peasantry and that they are poor because of their lack of land. Therefore, uh, it's called upon the newly established Ministry of Agriculture and Labor to implement the long-awaited land reform. Furthermore, the KMT's ranks must also be drawn by the growing number of proletariat in the nation's industrializing cities. The party must therefore support unionization and breaking both foreign and domestic chains. Fittingly, the draft has dedicated itself to the union of peasants and workers. Another less popular draft seeks to address the growing fears of division in the party state. If the party represents the nation, then it cannot afford to fall back into a state of quasi-civil war like at the Canton. The paper calls for reconciliation both with the former Kuomintang rightists and other democratic revolutionaries to build a new representative China. It also includes mention of fulfilling social and economic promises, and also is called for modernization and the forgiveness of past transgressions. At the end of the day, the drafts being showcased are just words from a relatively powerless legislature, but with the free expression often suppressed, whether de jure or de facto, often these halls are among the few places where free discussion is permitted. The declaration that ultimately passes will demonstrate the strength of the various caucuses, the peasants and workers, of unity within the party. Unity, peasants and workers. That's the way we like them. Increase integration? Oh, yes, we will. Declare the unification of China. We need Chongqing. 
Our foes have been vanquished, and anyone who dared to unjustly claim the mantle of national leadership has been put back in their place. We stand now as rulers and as a mostly united China. All that is left to do is formally claim our right to the national leadership. We're the victors of the board loaded are for better or for worse, and it is up to us to lead China to its benevolent future. Absolutely. Um, playing stuff is looking alright. What else do we need here for naval stuff? Guns, probably. That's easy and cheap to get. Mm, damage equipment. Piercing? Sure, why not? Oh, we're definitely going to go to war with Tibet, probably, eventually. Good. If you want to do this one again, please go ahead, too. Let's say you want. Click refuses to yield. Um, if you want to do this one, please go ahead. Well, they've chosen incredibly poorly. Like, how stupid are you? Oh, Yunnan is not in the... War? Guys, can you join in too, please? Oh. They can't guard every single tile here, so. They have most of the fronts on here, but that's fine. The Heartline of Fury. When it came to the ultimatum having come and gone, the looming war of the Sichuan clique has led to a surge in nationalist graft against Chen Zhongming and his public interest party. Red Jekylls across the halls of power Nanjing as radicals have seized the moment to clamor for revenge against the reactionaries, not only for the historic crimes against the Kuomintang, but for their own ongoing oppression of the people. This has had the side effect of weakening the position of the establishment, however muted, but still present questions about why Chen Zhongming does not sufficiently fear the party state and why harsher measures have not already been taken against them have been in the common political discourse. Odds are... That's better if his successes trickle in. His voice will fade in the background, but that's not to say they'll ever go away. A ring of anger watches over the party. Failure of talks will validate the views of Swiss hardliners. Downplay these historical sentiments. Clashing Titans. While many in the leftist dominated KMT are grateful for the international's aid and support throughout the air, some have not forgotten the KMT is indeed the Chinese Nationals Party. Many of the party witnessed events of the 1900 a Boxer Rebellion unfold and have grown up in a China long battered by Western powers. The French journalist, a member of the International's military mission in China, André Malraux, has recently returned from China to on leave to report to the, to the European Socialist Community on the whereabouts of the Chinese National Revolution. While he writes warmly of members of the Reorganization of Communist Association, he also writes warily of the intense politicization of the National Revolutionary Army, a concept unfamiliar to the French system of militias and the National Guard. Furthermore, as he presents Deng Yanda in a flattering and orientalist light, denouncing the latter as a Bonapartist. In return, Deng is fired back against such accusations by arguing that the MMIC has intervened in the existing structure of the NRA by promoting individuals such as Zhu and Lai, amongst other conflicts. He rumbles that the MMIC behaved recklessly, willing to expend Chinese soldiers like their own version of Sepoys or Ascari. The tyrants invite a difficult look into the NRA's politicalization, as more nationals members of the NRA have sided with Deng. In contrast, European trained officers have sided with the Malro and decisions made by the MMIC. Here's with the potential foie de pas. The leadership of the KMT must act quickly in deciding whether or not to reprimand the haughty Napoleon in the making, or reprimand the foreign power or foreign sower of discord. Reprimand Alondro. Oh, okay, why not? Even though we're not winning here, it still gives us some army, tiny bit of army speed, and we can still move in here and keep these guys in place. The CSP radicals ascended. The Chinese Cynicalist Party, under the leadership of the Chen Duyi and Li Lisan, have often been playing a kid. Uh, content playing a junior submissive role. Uh, I think I've read this one before, actually. If you want to do this one, please go ahead again. Yeah. Curing a poison nation. Opium has long plague, been a plague in the nation. And in many ways, a symbol of the degeneration of the once proud Chinese nation. Uh, like an addict who fell from grace, China was brought low by the mass addiction and pressed onto it by unscrupulous foreign capitalists and their imperialist backers. Now, the Kuan thing is to save their nation's soul. They must heal the corruption at its source. With, that, with many warlords, officials, and unfortunately even socials like us profiting off the trade, cracking down has been a tall order. It's already a source of profit, despite the human costs involved, and plenty of other narcotics have flown to the nation in the meanwhile. Bureaus, agencies, and non-governmental reformers have tried to no avail, although with the recent consolidation of control, there's hope for genuine change this time. Stop it. A series of wide-ranging proposals have been presented by various medical, uh, legal, and social experts. These include various rehabilitation policies, harsh arrests, and punishments of dealers, and aggressive targeting of opium-producing regions for destructing... Uh, destruction and replant, replanting. On the flip side, however, it's possible that a government-run monopoly on these special goods might be what is actually needed at the moment for the revolutionary government to survive. Whatever is decided, it will likely be at least a decade before opium is eradicated. A necessary evil for unification. Nation advice to be stamped out. A medical issue to be treated. Oh, yeah. It definitely is a medical issue that needs to be treated. Chongqing, please, yes? We lost way more, but they're... Actually, they got a lot of divisions. Holy cow. That's a lot. Doesn't mean they're good. 
but that's a lot. A new day for the left camp to military. Tanner's military has taken a severe dive in quality over the last few years, despite the abundance of veteran officers produced by the Warlord era. Many have achieved their ranks through nepotism, all corruption, or favoritism. While others, even competent ones, exploit the power for their own ends, our efforts have involved cleaning up the ghost rosters, stopping desertion, and eliminating patronage, increasing accountability within our ranks. A uh, new batch of officers have been trained to this end, and still with a patriotic spirit and hopefully less beholden to corruption than the previous generations. These officers will join an army thoroughly reformed from the inside outwards, and ready to, re ready to liberate our nation. Uh, through our efforts, they have become a professional force, comparable to that of Europe and Japan. May they ensure China will never be divided or humiliated ever again. Our triumph, our army's triumph, even off the battlefield. Look at that. 35% more recruitable population, better ex experienced soldiers' losses, and way more daily command power gain. So they should be mobilizing quite a bit. Nice. Good. Green water ship, maybe. Just in case we need it later on. Um... Buns gain, yeah, there you go. Good. Our right, reference is integrate Shang-Chi. If you want to read this, please go ahead. Hey, you want step further. Ah, uh, you know, I don't know why they just wanted to fight to the death. They've lost a quarter million Chinese. Like, it makes no sense. Why would you fight to the death for this? Declare the reunification of China. Will be known as the Republic of China. The white sun arises, calls for a national congress. Lose a lot of political power, stability, and war. China's been unified, but at a heavy cost, of course. Thousands, if not millions, have been died since the start of the Warlord era. Families have been divided and countless displaced from their homes. Yet in the end, the KMT has emerged as sole victor, destroying the outlasting of a half dozen or so other factions that once dared vie for national leadership. The party Sun Yat-sen is all that remains now, proof that they claim of the revolution's moral superiority. The truth, as it always is, is murky. The party has banded fiercely together against foreign invaders and domestic foes, united by nationalism and revolutionary promises. But even at the height of their accomplishments, there were no cracks. There were cracks in this united front, with internal threats, external threats, receding the party as is divided as ever. The people too have grown tired of this arbitrariness of the de facto military rule, with an inconsistent application of civilian political tutelage and military governance across the nation. Surely, the masses are grateful of unification and celebrate the imperialists sinking back to their homelands. But they have also made clear their unwillingness to bear further sacrifice without a clear vision for the future. Matters are coming to a head, and observers are on the lookout for further instability in the future political developments. As the party state works to clean up scattered resistance, a growing chorus of voices have demanded another special national congress held by the KMT. This time with full representation from across the room, and if the congress awaits, we now select the third repatriated congress to focus bring us into the end game. Oh, cool. Oh, with well, this one. Uh, just uh, annex Hunan. And Yunnan. And eventually Shang-Chi, you were the last one we had here. Demand the Xinjiang Xi's submission. Oh god dang it, that's gonna be really god awful, isn't it? Are you connected at all? Yeah, you're lightly connected, barely here. There you go. Well, that's why I got the horses here. Oof. I do not want to be them. Um Good job, guys. Train, your butt's off. Salvage Japanese industry, reception of government legitimacy. Korea reborn. Contact the youth groups. Revolution triumphant. Socialist regime. Wait, what? You better be socialists. Because if not, we're going to have some serious problems here. Folks, you would change. You'll be split. It will still be possible to fully upgrade military national spirits. Uh, I want to get through all this stuff first, maybe. So, we're going to go this one next, maybe. I'm going to dare to die for. Um, invasion, we're going to do that, too. Yeah. I don't want these subs. These are garbage. Japan is removed from the Legation Council. Good. Hey, no political power today. National Reconstruction Commission. The National Reconstruction Commission is a brainchild of the late Dr. Sun Yat-sen that wrote that during the phase of political tutelage, Steps should be taken in order to ensure the country both modernizes and democratizes successfully. If China's to be a great world power again, she must be built from the ground up with the help of the Chinese KMT. This is destroying our supplies. While the national reconstruction efforts were significantly bailed, or held back by the first and second northern expeditions, the completion of the second northern expeditions finally gave the party a chance to fulfill the Jiangxi goal of the 1911 Jinnai Revolution. As we're now able to fully set, set back from the propaganda military stage uh, of the revolution, 
uh, in accordance with the principles of a great eternal premier. We must now enter the political and economic reconstruction stage of the National Revolution, step by step, factory by factory, farm by farm, while rebuild the country's great economic and political foundation so that China can forever resist uh, foreign imperialism and return itself to greatness. Now yeah, they submit. Look at this, please go ahead. Nice. We are magnanimous rulers. Great. Fantastic. We don't have to do anything with them then. Let's get our guys out of here. Jesus Christ. Um, just in case, we're going to come down here then. Really don't trust Japan. Basic torpedoes are good. Pragmatic Revolutionary Partnerships. The capitulation of Mao Xiaowu to the Kuomintang Revolutionary Pole was a pleasant, if not necessarily unexpected, surprise in Nanjing. The reactionary wars that make up Dao Yin of Hotan tended to be a pragmatic sword, and this latest change in uniform is probably only natural, switching from one master to a newer, redder one. This uh, wise decision to accept the Kuomintang ultimatum has probably saved thousands of lives, at least for now, though that fact, widely publicized by the party's propaganda machine, could hardly, waste, hardly wash the taste of disgust from the mouth of party hardliners. Indeed, underneath, the pomp and ceremony, the recent changing of the flags in Xinjiang, the political reality likely to remain largely unchanged in Dihua. The Havo Guan, probably under a hierarchy of local reactionary autocrats who may at best doubt Kuomintang regalia as a fashion statement and play lip service to the ideals they represent, but otherwise will disgrace the party's message. Wang Jingwei and other authorities have broken this agreement promise. They will provide adequate oversight into Xinjiang's affairs, and ultimately Xinjiang's unorthodoxy will be rendered moot upon national unification, but even if they race to integrate the newfound conquest, it remains to be seen whether or not the fat sacrifices of the people living there will be worth it. A necessary evil, I suppose. We must minimize the corrupting influence. Inherited comrades arms. Years of exile and reliance on the third international has led us to become familiarized with the weaponry of our European socialist friends. Their assholes contain many outdated pieces, such as the French 75mm. They nonetheless can be repurposed for military use in China. The weapons that once held them win in their own revolutions at home will now serve to aid our revolutions and create the supply corps. An army marches on its stomach. The fact that our international advisor quick to remind us of, we need our sustained operations long enough. Along the front line as large as China, we cannot simply rely on ad hoc supply chains or generosity of the locals. Instead, a centralized, regularly monitored system of provisions must be created that allows us to fight across long distances. Brace autarchy. Um, demanding the KMT, the roots of China's woes, lies in our unfortunate economic dependence on the imperialist world, which seeks to do nothing more than take advantage of our natural resources and wealth. With the leadership of the party, while we embrace the notion and idea of economic self-sufficiency, however, we also promote the growth of national capitalism in select coastal regions to help develop our economy. Uh, and create the NEC, which I read earlier, I believe. And develop heavy industry sector. It's about the industrial port cities. The industrialization China is still lacking compared to the rest of the world. Most of our initial industrial reforms are centered around the development of light and civilian industries. We are expanding our industrial efforts by promoting the creation of large industrial projects for both military and civilian use. Intensify education reforms. Lead the liberation of Asia. Huh. Despite our best efforts at promoting national literacy, our research capabilities and nationwide education are still vastly behind our competitors. Let's encourage the rapid development of intellectual and education reforms so that we can catch up with the rest of the world. Complete the national reconstruction. More than almost 200 factories. Develop heavy industry sector, which we will do as well. And if not completed, we lose a lot of stuff. Oh, God. The party's grand project is um, fully launched and is supported by the members of both the Provisional Act Committee and the Reorganized Commerce Association. Was unity between the factions of the party fulfill the National Reconstruction Project, failure to do so may lead to the loss of political power for one faction and the gaining power for another. Delay the reconstruction. Despite our best efforts, our engineers and workers are having difficulty meeting the deadlines. We'll have to petition the NEC for an extended timeline of the completion of the project, nationalize the Nanjing Electrical Works. A grandiose plan inspired by the developments in London and in Paris, the Nanjing Electrical Works seeks to eliminate the grand capital city of the National China. The National uh, Agency is one of the first to confront the ambiguities of the late Dr. Sun Yat-sen's academic thought regarding what should fall under the public and private spheres of the economy. As such, nationalizing and reorganizing the electrical works will bring electricity to the thousands living in Nanjing's darkness, and we'll read the last one. Uh, establish Yongli chemical plant. China's a nation dependent on the soil. Lacks the means and industries for modern fertilizers to enhance and increase agricultural output, led by Fan Zhudang. The project at Yongli aims to construct China's first fertilizer plant that's developed native sulfuric acid, synthetic ammonia, and nitric acid. The project is also led by British and French advisors with the goal of producing tons of ammonia, acid, and sulfate per day. But if you enjoyed the video, though, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out our Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. As we'll continue to do very well and uh, continue expanding and making China ours completely. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.